So, um, so I'm recording this session so that people who couldn't join us today can join us later on. Um, I'll be putting this up on our YouTube um, WPA Go channel. Uh, so a couple announcements. The first one is that there's going to be a WPA Go information session um, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. If you are not already a part of the WPA Go or you've heard about it but you're not exactly sure what it is and you'd like to learn some more or you're a member who's interested in joining our graduate committee, um, this would be a really good time to find out some more information about the organization. So um, I'm going to be sending around a link after this call. Uh, where you can RSVP for that info session. Um, if you can't join us tomorrow, we have another info session coming up on February 19th, which will be at 5 p.m. Um, Central Standard Time. So you could join one of the two of those. Um, I, I'm going to check with the participants, but I think we'll also be recording those and um, providing links. Um, our next community call is going to be in March, and we're still firming up the date, but it's probably going to be early March, like around the 5th or 6th. Um, that'll be a call on navigating C's this year, four C's this year as a graduate student. So we'll have um, some members from a couple of the caucuses, um, a member from the newcomers committee, a member from the social justice um, task force, and then some of the graduate committee members from WPA go joining us for that call. So if it's your first time at C's or if you're staying home this year and you'd like to learn about distance participation opportunities, um, or if you've been to C's several times, but you just want to go, you know, because of the context of this year's C's, um, if you'd like to learn some strategies for navigating, um, that would be a great call to join. Um, I'd also just like to give a quick shout out to our social media page. So um, if you are a Facebook user and you would like to figure out what's happening in Go, um, that's a really good way to, to learn. Uh, that's where we post pretty much every announcement that we have about any initiative that's going on in the organization. So, um, please go to Facebook and like our page to find out more updates. And yeah, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley Petz, Hannah Stevens, and Krista Aldrich of North Dakota State University, who will be talking about grading contracts in the writing classroom. So thank you. All right. Do we wanna introduce ourselves further? <laughs> that was a pretty good introduction. Yeah. So we'll probably just go ahead and share our screen to our PowerPoint. Structure. Oh yeah. So briefly, while I'm getting the screen shared here, um, we do want to kind of explain the structure of what we're looking for with this call. So, oops, sorry, go back to the beginning. Um, so we thought that we'd talk for around 45 minutes, maybe 40, 45 minutes, just about um, everything that we've learned, what a grading contract is, um, some challenges, and then the rationale for using a grading contract in the writing classroom. And then we're going to open it up to questions. Um, we also have one sample grading contract we can show if people are interested in that as well, um, but we'll save that until probably the end. Um, okay, so to start, we just want to give a little bit about our positionality. We talked about this a little bit just as we were communicating back and forth, but we were all part of um, a Sao Inouye's anti-racist assessment summary scholar course here at NDSU. Um, so we just wanted to kind of state that our positionality on grading contracts come from our exposure to grading contracts via that class. And it is directly influenced by anti-racist assessment for the most part. Um, but we want to state that there are a variety of rationales and approaches to grading contracts outside of anti-racist assessment, but ours comes from that positionality. We also wanted to state that um, we've done a previous presentation on grading contracts within our own department that was worked um, in collaboration also with Taya Noel and Abby Fincell, who are both part of the English department. So we wanted to give them a shout out that they did a lot of work with this presentation too that we um, have left in, but they have collaborated with us in the past. So to start thinking about what a grading contract is, um, a lot of the times we get the question of what the difference between a grading contract and a syllabus is. A lot of people consider their syllabi a contract that you really do enter into with the students, but I think that a grading contract goes a little bit further um, and it's more about an alternative assessment or an alternative grading method that really facil facilitates more of a collaboration between your students and yourself. Um, the structure of the classroom, at least in our experience, really changes underneath a grading contract. Um, there isn't really that hierarchy of you being the supreme being at the top 
and then your students kind of being below you, there really is that collaboration where you communicate back and forth and really decide the structure of the class from there. Um, so part of that structure with the grading contract works with um, deciding how your semester will progress. So students and instructors um, can work together on, to develop rubrics, as most of us do um, with this presentation. We um, have various ways of approaching that, but we all work with our students to develop our rubrics. We're not, we don't give our rubrics to our students and then tell them, you know, that's what we're looking for with this paper. Um, we really work together to see what the goals the students have in our class to carry forward with their writing. Um, and then another part that really makes it more of a collaboration is that students are really allowed to choose what grade they're going for. Um, we do labor-based grading contracts for the most part, and that means that you're graded based on what um, labor and the amount that you put in. So if you're looking to get a higher grade in the class, it's really contingent on completing additional assignments, going above and beyond that original labor that the instructor sets. Um, so that really fosters more of a collaboration where the students are choosing what they want to work on, what their goals are for the class, what they're really wanting to learn out of the writing classroom. Um, so for the rationale, it's kind of why would you consider doing a grading contract? And a lot of that stems from 4C's students write to their own language. Um, as published, it says, we affirm the students' right to their own patterns and varieties of language, the dialects of their nurture, or whatever dialects in which they find their own identity and style. The four C's officially took a stand regarding teachers forcing students to abandon their language um, and by extension their identity when they prioritize the standard edited American English. Um, and SEAE is inherently a privileged classist and is highly gendered, right? So students who have access to that, this so-called standard um, that most people believe is a standard, um, they have access to or familiarity with SEAE and they come from a certain class or, and are often privileged members of society. Um, SEAE is not a one size fits all and privileged members of society are likely to have a firmer grasp on it because they are privileged. Um, a grading contract allows students from multiple native dialects to succeed. Grading contracts allow students to choose which writing style they would like to practice. Um, and students have the opportunity to re request SEAE feedback if they prefer, but it isn't necessarily mandatory. They are exper experts on their own dialect and a grading contract allows them to put that expertise to work. Um, in this class, we do a lot of framework of their collaborators and everybody is an expert in something. And then uh, students come into our classroom with different skill sets, dialects, and various levels of experience within a writing classroom. A grading contract that measures labor recognizes all labor for the course equally, thereby suggesting that we as instructors are measuring our students equally for effort as opposed to our subjective perspectives on quality. That speaks to more uh, this idea that the teacher is looking for something and what I would say is good writing might not be what Hannah or Ashley says is good writing. Hi, um, so I'm Ashley Petz and I'm gonna be talking about some of the benefits of grading contracts. Um, so you might notice that there might be a tiny lag. So Hannah, who is the first speaker, and Krista, who just finished, um, we're all in the same room. So we actually have our, uh, Krista and I have our mics off. Um, so yeah, you could just, I can see myself and it's like a little bit behind, but it's okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to go over some of the benefits of grading contracts. Of course, these aren't all the benefits. Um, one of the first benefits of grading contracts as opposed to our traditional method of grading is because writing is so highly contextual, criteria for letter grades can never be precise enough. So for instance, what is the difference between a 98% and a 96% on an assignment? Are teachers able to be that precise across an entire classroom so that all 98% writing papers are of equal quality? or of all 96 are of equal quality. Um, it's just very difficult to reach that level of precision with writing and, and actually the same is true even in other disciplines where you might think there would be a higher level of precision. So something like a math course, um, 
studies have shown even in those courses, uh, the, same, the same work is graded differently. Another benefit is that grading contracts um, lessen but don't entirely, entirely eliminate issues with grading writing. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, um, grades themselves are not a scientific measurement and a lot of research has shown that they don't provide useful information. So in writing studies, we often focus on giving students comments and that's really a good practice. Um, even research has shown that a letter grade with comments, um, students tend to pay some attention to the comments, right? So they don't just look at the letter grade. But when you just have a letter grade on an assignment that doesn't really provide feedback or useful information to the students. Um, so with grading contracts, instead of providing letter grades, we really emphasize a lot of written feedback, perhaps more than you would do in traditional grading. But this gives students um, more useful information for uh, their writing practices. Another thing about grades, and I know this is uh, true for me personally, and probably for a lot of us, is that grades reward extrinsic motivation instead of intrinsic. So um, students who, you know, good students, they want to earn A's, they're kind of just, you know, focused on getting the good grade um, rather than learning itself. Um, so the whole grading system, we're kind of, um, you know, uh, introduced to that from, from kindergarten onwards, perhaps, but we learn to to just go for the good grade, and that's our goal in uh, school. So again, grading contracts can't entirely um, get rid of the idea of extrinsic motivation, like perhaps a student still wants to get good feedback um, from the teacher, but at the very least it lessens, you know, it gives students the opportunity to, to focus on their own, what they're interested in learning and sort of reward intrinsic motivation. Another um, benefit of grading contracts, as opposed to traditional grading, is that students often equate grades with their sense of self-worth or worth as a writer. Um, so a student might get, let's say, a C on a paper, and then they think of themselves as a C student or a C writer. And that's not beneficial to learning necessarily, and that's not beneficial to students' growth um, as writers because, again, grades aren't that precise. Um, a C is not reflective of them as a person, that's just a letter that's on a piece of paper. Um, but we put so much emphasis on grades that it can really um, damage students' um, sense of themselves. Um, some other uh, issues with traditional uh, writing that grading contracts can, can sort of lessen, or, but not again, not entirely eliminate. Um, Grades tend to promote superficial learning, so just as they tend to, to encourage students to go for the A or the B, um, you know, they're just, it's a system that rewards uh, just getting the right answers or getting the answers that students think the teacher wants, right? So teach, students will write to what they think the teacher wants so that they can get an A or a B on the paper. Um, which is not necessarily <laughs> indicative of deep learning. Um, another thing that grading contracts can help with um, is sort of flipping the classroom or helping students um, recognize their own agency. So grades kind of, they help to reinforce the idea that the teacher has all the answers, right? Um, the teacher is the one with all the knowledge and students, you know, need to just absorb the knowledge from the teacher or you know make sure that they pick the right answers or write the paper in the right way um, but the teacher ultimately is the authority in the classroom and grading contracts can help to sort of diminish the idea of the teacher as the sole authority um, finally because grades um, are you know we often grade in points or percentages they encourage instructors to focus on things that we can identify as correct or incorrect or right answers or things that are measurable. So things like grammar and spelling and punctuation, which we can mark as correct or incorrect if we're expecting our students, for instance, to uh, write in standard ed edited American English, we can mark them off if their grammar is off um, because that can help us get a numeric number, right, that grades, um, grades sort of push us towards. Instead of things like higher order concerns, um, such as content and organization, which it's harder to sign, assign a precise uh, letter or number to. 
And then finally, and this echoes some of what Hannah and Krista have already mentioned, um, but grading contracts themselves can help uh, create an environment where students take responsibility for their learning. So in the grading contract system that the three of us use here, um, we, we come in the first day with the contract uh, all written out, but we also give students the oppor opportunity to negotiate it at the beginning of the semester. Um, so this helps see themselves as um, authors, first of all, but also people who are responsible for their own learning, right? So they have an investment from day one. Um, and as we mentioned before, we also do that with our rubric. So for each assignment, um, so we collaborate on what students will be assessed on. Um, it also helps to free students from focusing solely on grades rather than on their writing or learning. Um, so we have a quote here from a Sal Inouye's um, course that we took with him in the summer where in his sort of his rationale and justification for grading contracts, he wrote that students, quote, worry more about pleasing a teacher or fooling one than about figuring out what they really want to learn and how they want to communicate something to someone for some purpose. Um, so again, when, when the emphasis, when the, when the emphasis on grades isn't there, students can have the opportunity to learn, to think more about their learning and to focus on that and to focus on, you know, writing than worrying about what their teacher thinks. Um, Another really great benefit is instructors can focus on written feedback rather than justifying a grade. Um, so one thing I, we've talked about among the three of us is how in the past, um, we kind of felt like our feedback, um, we had to sort of justify our grade through the feedback, right? Like those had to match up exactly. And um, we sometimes had difficulty deciding, well, how is it, you know, what it makes us an A, even with our rubrics, even with everything sort of uh, written out for us. With this system, you know, our entire focus is on the written feedback. So we can really spend time giving students, um, working with students and giving them feedback that they'll find useful instead of worrying about how we're gonna justify why they got an A or B. Um, and then finally, with grading contracts, especially the ones that we use uh, that are labor-based, so, um, students get uh, earn the grade in the class by uh, by how much by what they do and how much time they spend on things. Um, so they're not going to be you know they're not going to lose points if they take a risk or if they write something that we we as teachers don't like, right? So this kind of system can encourage students to take those kinds of risks that they might be afraid to take if they're worried about just getting an A or B on a paper um, because you know, they can take a risk and it might not work, but they're not going to fail. Um, so that's a really big um, benefit for, for this kind of system. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about some of the challenges that you might encounter when you do a grading contract. Um, so the first one is that students don't understand the contract. This one is twofold. Uh, they don't understand the contract itself and or they don't understand the reasoning behind it. Um, furthermore, they likely will not ask for clarification until halfway through the semester or until the contract is broken. Um, and then many of them don't keep track of where they are depending on what your contract looks like. Um, and I can expand on that one once we're um, going through the actual grading contract example. Uh, second one is that you will find gaps in the contracts. Uh, no matter how thorough you are, um, you're not going to be able to anticipate all of the learners in your classroom and they are going to think of something that you probably hadn't thought of before. Um, so no matter how well designed your contract, there are going to be gaps and you just have to be okay with that. It's, it's a learning process. Um, the absence of traditional grades creates anxiety in students. Uh, this is very true. Uh, I can attest to it when <laughs> we had our own grading contract. Um, this is a new approach to our students and at least here the students at NDSU are often served by traditional grading which uh, just because they are white they are privileged. Um, they have experience with SDAE. They are able to um, produce the work that they understand is correct. Um, because they're so anxious, it takes 
a long time to explain the contract to them sometimes. Um, and then again, they don't ask questions. <laughs> so you kind of have to cultivate a space where, um, you know, you, you kind of make them ask questions about the grading contract, kind of force them to tangle with it, or at least demonstrate an understanding. Uh, potentially, the grading contract is more work for the instructor. Creating the contract is pretty labor intensive. Um, I will kind of have a benefit within this though, is that you can really focus on what you want for your own contract. Not all contracts are going to be the same and actually it'd be surprising if they were. Um, and the potentially more work for the instructor, another thought is that the feedback that we give is more work. It's um, worthwhile work, but it is more work rather than just saying A, B, you know, kind of going through it and justifying the grade. Uh, the grading contract does not eliminate the cultural importance of grades. Um, students still want the A or the B and they likely still want um, extra credit. So that kind of is a hard thing to, to explain saying like, there isn't really extra credit because this is a grading contract. Um, sometimes it might be difficult as instructors to give up some of your authority. You know, in anticipating the grading contract, it's worrisome that students will slack off or think your class is unimportant. Um, the fact of the matter is the, our approach to it is you aren't the prime authority in the classroom, you are a collaborator. You know, that might be a challenge to some people. Uh, and then lastly, our positionality impacts how our students see us. Uh, I'm teaching from a body and my body is female and it is relatively young. So in our experience, at least, I think you too, Ashley, there's mm -hmm. been, a, there's a bit of a pushback. Um, and honestly, it's likely because we are female. And that these aren't all of the challenges. I think these are probably the most common ones that you might come across. And the ones that I think all of us have come across. Yeah. Um, that's where our, this one isn't necessarily as backed by research as our rationale is. This is more by our own, mm -hmm. what we have encountered in using grading contracts. Um, so then thinking about our kind of our own positionality and why we wanted to do a grading contract, con contract in our class, excuse me, um, we're each going to kind of talk about what the structure of our classrooms look like because all three of us teach in very different structured, very different level um, type classes. Mm -hmm. So Krista, you want to start? Yeah, um, I teach English 120. It's basically the freshman English, um, except it's in a hybrid format. So I meet with my students face to face once a week and everything else is online. Um, the most difficult part of that, I would say, is having that initial conversation because I only see them once a week. It's harder for them to understand that like, I am welcoming some changes to this contract or I'm, I'm welcoming that conversation at least. Um, a lot of what I do with my grading contract is um, I do response papers as some of the smaller work, which makes them tangle with um, ideas that they might not normally confront. So I do a lot of, um, they have to respond to a reading and some of those options are like, unpacking the knapsack of privilege. Um, I have a chapter on white privilege within of like the history of it because a lot of them are like, don't quite understand or they don't, it doesn't quite click that like white is a race um, and stuff like that. So they have to tangle with these ideas and I'm not saying that they can disagree, I'm not, they can agree, disagree, or they can, um, talk about how it changed the way they thought about something, but this is all very academically backed up. So they can't just say, well, I disagree because I don't like that. They have to tangle with the reading, they have to quote it, stuff like that. So mine, I guess, um, mine's a little different. So I have taught both face-to-face -face with a grading contract and I introduced a grading contract into my primarily online class this semester. Um, both English 120, so freshman level, um, college composition. My class, the structure that I take is primarily student driven. Every step of the way, my students decide what they would like to learn, what they would like feedback on, um, things that they want to talk about in class. And I think that that is both um, 
a benefit of a grading contract because it allows that collaboration with my students, but it's also one of the biggest challenges I have because going into the classroom, I don't always necessarily know what I'm gonna be teaching. I have a broad idea of what I would like to talk about that day, but my students are really the ones that bring in the materials that they would like to talk about. Um, if we want to spend an extra day on ethos, logos, pathos, and bring in more examples of that, that's things that we choose to do as a group. Um, so my class is really student driven. I've also um, really experimented with rubrics in my section of English 120, both my face-to-face -face that I taught last semester and my online that I'm teaching now, my students create their own individual rubrics, um, which I have found to be really beneficial to having my students really understand the goal-oriented nature of my class because they are creating an individual rubric. Um, I will assess them based on what they want assessment on and if they, end up being assessed below expectations, they really have nobody to blame but themselves. Um, that's kind of harsh, but that's the conversation I have with my students about, you know, you wanted to really learn about the structure of a memoir and you maybe fell short on that even with your own rubric. Um, so that's kind of a broad overview of my structure. The online, I'm only in week five, I have found to be interesting. Um, online classes, I think, have the stigma of being easier, and I don't think with a grading contract, I think half my students understand it wouldn't be easier, and the other half are still kind of coming to terms with that. Um, so the biggest challenge I found both with face-to-face -face and my online style classroom is that my students are not necessarily used to staying in communication with me. Um, I had quite a few issues last semester where things would happen that the grading contract really it was beneficial to them because it wasn't like they got points off for their paper being late or something like that. But a lot of the times they would come to me after the fact. And I think that's just representative of kind of the structure of our, some of our learning environments. They're not used to me being that collaborator that we're, I'm constantly talking to them. I'm constantly pushing them to tell me more about themselves and not just be a body in a seat listening to me lecture at them. Um, yeah, so it's been a very interesting, but very beneficial journey, for sure. Great, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my experiences with this and what we call upper division writing at NDSU. Um, so NDSU has a vertical writing program. Um, students are required to take the 100 level, um, so 110 or 120 um, English composition, and then they also take a 300 or 400 level class in their junior and senior year, and this is across the university. Um, so I teach a grant and proposal writing class, and it's a 400 level class. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed in, in my course is that the grading contract ends up being really good for promoting project management and self-management, which are things that we try to promote in um, grant and proposal writing to begin with, right? So these are juniors and seniors. They've been in school a little bit longer, so we have a little bit higher expectations for how they um, manage their work. And so um, this would also be true, I think, if you taught a tech writing course or a business writing course. Um, first of all, you know, in these kinds of courses, um, we we might introduce them to the kinds of writing that they'll do in the workplace, and they will certainly, as soon as they um, enter the workforce, um, they'll probably be, uh, you know, confronted with the contract first, you know, first off. Um, so the concept of a contract is useful, um, but also just the fact that students um, really with this contract I emphasize that they should be managing themselves and their own absences and their own work um, so they know from the beginning when things are due um, and they know what the tasks are um, but the contract itself the way it's it's set up um, I think it encourages students to take more responsibility um, for their work and then also their t their own like time and project management <laughs> And the class is very collaborative, so um, there's a lot of group work in there too. Um, one challenge I've seen in, in using the grading contract in uh, the grant writing course, and this has been mentioned before, but it is sometimes difficult to anticipate uh, certain situations. Um, so last semester around midterm, there was um, a, we had like an in-class sort of essay checking up on things. 
And I didn't have in my contract what would happen if you weren't at the sort of um, midterm essay. Like I, I didn't have that, like what the consequences were um, because it is different than just missing a regular day. Um, you'd be missing, you know, like a, it's like not showing up for, you're not turning in an assignment. Um, so I had one student who did not, um, who wasn't there and didn't let me know in advance and stuff like that. And so I didn't actually, it wasn't very clear in my contract what I should do in that situation. Um, so I did finally come to a solution. I figured um, looking at the, what I had written for what happens when you miss an assignment, I would apply that um, to that situation. Um, but that is one of the challenges. So sometimes situations come up that don't quite match what you have in the contract or your contract um, might not have enough detail to begin with. I, mine certainly did in my first semester. Um, so it, it's just difficult to know, you know, you can't know in advance what will happen. So that's one of the challenges um, for sure is sometimes it just doesn't, things happen that you're not sure how they fit in with what you have. Yeah. So we want to open up this time to Q&A or what you guys, I feel like we, we gave you a ton of information. Um, what you want maybe more clarification on, what you have questions on, um, or I could jump straight into showing you Krista's grading contract that she would, um, has generously offered us to go through. So whatever you guys would like, we'll treat this like a grading contract. We'll, collab <laughs> we'll collaborate within our call. I can't see anybody's face. <laughs> I can, I think that you can like wave. <laughs> Yeah, I just saw that someone has the, their hand raised, so I'm going to unmute your mic. Um, that's Amanda. Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, I just have a question about the rubrics um, in the context of the grading contract. So I don't know if you guys have any examples of how to collaborate and how to structure a rubric if individual assignments aren't being graded. Do you want to talk about that more? Yeah, because, um, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, so the way that I do... Um, rubrics is essentially I have a discussion board for my students that they it's one of the small things that they have to do and the way that my grading contracts work is you can only miss X amount of small assignments before you um, decrease essentially but they have to post like three or four ideas after we've read some of the genre or after we have experienced how they're written or talked a little bit about it um, and then they talk a little bit about what they think is important in representing that genre. Um, and sometimes I get a lot of, you know, sometimes I get things that are just like, it meets the um, assignment parameters, you know, in my assignment sheet. So, you know, it, it hits the page mark. Um, so I, the most recent one that I've done is a literacy narrative. And I got a lot of students that were talking about um, showing versus telling, but also talking about like um, explaining the significance of the event rather than just letting it lie as is. Um, so it's just kind of a matter of collating that data and finding trends. And the way that I do it is I have on this last one, I have like three main points, and then underneath those are bullet points that describe it of anywhere from like four to ten explanation of like what that looks like um, I don't know if I'd be happy to share what that like the most recent one that I came up with if anybody's like wants to see what that looks like um, but it's very much we collaborate we talk about what is important in this genre and what is important to them too I don't know how I yeah, I guess I would add, so the part about collaborating on rubrics, it does take a lot of um, preparation on both your part and the parts of the um, students. So for instance, um, in my class, we still have assignment sheets, but we come up with the assessment criteria together. And I found um, first time I tried that, I don't think I gave them enough time. So they had, they had readings. So, um, you know, the first assignment was a a genre that helps you prepare for a proposal. So um, like a letter of intent or letter of inquiry. So they did know what letter of intents or letter, you know, letters of inquiry are. Um, but, and they had read the assignment sheet. So logistically, like sort of logistics behind this, like I would ask them, 
Um, I gave them like 15 minutes to discuss with one another, like what's important, what they would like to be assessed on. And then I opened up a Google doc um, and we sort of worked on it together. Um, and it does, so that, that's, that would be a, I think 15 minutes was enough as long as they have time to prepare. Um, another time I did, I didn't give them as much time to prepare. I'm like, okay, just what do you want to be assessed on? And it didn't work as well. So um, they were, you know, they need time to think through. Um, and so even if I gave, like, it worked better when they had the assignment sheets and then my class only meets once a week. So if I gave it to them the week before and they had time to look it over, um, we got much better assessment criteria than when I gave them less time um, because they, you know, it's, it's a little bit, this is something that we learned in a sales class and we did this ourselves and it was pretty easy for us to come up with assessment criteria because we're all like grad students and writing instructors. So we kind of know what, you know, we want to be assessed on, but um, students not, it's a little harder. So I would say, um, yeah, just giving them time. You kind of have to guide them through it a little bit. Um, and then I had a stipulation that, you know, every you know, group had to come up with something different. So I learned that too. The first time I didn't say that. And then there were three that were all the same. Um, so we, since we were working on it on, on Google Docs, everyone could kind of see what was on there. So just so that people, you know, had to really think, like students had to really think through and not just write like what someone else had. Mm -hmm. I think that timing is important too. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I do rubric creation with my students, I usually have it happen in like week three-ish um, for that unit. So that way they have tangled with some of the ideas. They might have read some things. They might have, um, you know, picked apart an example to see, well, this really worked, but this didn't. And that oftentimes influences what they're putting for the rubric creation. Yeah, and I have my students, I do the exact same thing, but my students do individual rubrics. So they do all of this group work together, but then it's on them to really decide what they then wanna put onto their own rubric. So they can fall back on their colleagues for advice and help, but ultimately it's their decision. Um, and I have a really long conversation with my students about pros and cons of rubrics. A lot of students love rubrics because it tells them exactly what is supposed to be in that paper so they can follow it step by step. But a lot of my students voice that they don't like, especially in English courses or writing courses, they don't like how ambiguous terminology can be in rubrics or that sometimes they'll find that instructors will say, well, you thought it meant this, but it actually meant this. So it kind of plays more on that, um, trying, to, trying to guess what the instructor wants. Um, so I really have them reflect on that and then we have a really long conversation about what we can do to fix that, how we can be as clear as possible in our rubrics, how you know we can't just say use of rhetorical structure because that's so ambiguous that that could literally mean anything. Um, so it's a lot of collaboration on just what they're looking to get out of that rubric and that assignment and the writing course in general. Yeah. Yep, just takes time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of time, yeah. a lot of investment. So then those are the things that you guide your written feedback on. I'm just like having a hard time um, coming to terms with like the absence of grades and still the presence of a rubric since I like, associate those two things together. Yeah, so it, I guess for mine, they don't necessarily get a grade on their paper. Mm -hmm. um, I use the terms, um, well, and we took this yeah, straight from the too. We thought we took um, gin. Oh, gin, yeah. <laughs> I think it was, sorry, gin, <laughs> I'm misattributing things. But I use, like, exceeds expectations, so the student decides what would be something that would exceed expectations. And a lot of times, especially with, like, I just got done teaching a narrative, students will voice to me that they're not comfortable using dialogue. So something like dialogue could be their criteria, like use of voice or dialogue within the paper. And then the meets or the exceeds expectations would literally be like used 10 lines of dialogue, whatever they decide for that parameter. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's how they're graded. They're given that meets expectations on that criteria. Um, and I've, I think I've had, out of all of the times that I've done this, I've only had like a couple that have gotten below expectations because you use that kind of continuum, continuum or what is the word I'm looking for? Spectrum. Spectrum mm -hmm. of exceeds expectations, meets expectations, and then below expectations. And instead of then giving that, you know, 
um, A, B, or C, it's basically if you've met expectations or exceeded on all of the criteria, then you get credit for that paper. If it's below expectations, that's where something needs to be edited. Um, or it's a conversation you have with the student on what they can then do to improve that paper in the portfolio, which most of us, I think, yeah, um, we have a yeah, we have a yeah. portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I do yeah. yeah, I do something similar that Hannah does, but in addition to that, I also have like overall the paper will receive like a check, check plus, or check minus. Um, and that's the check minus is it has to be redone either for the portfolio or if they want to redo it before the portfolio, then I'm fine with that too. But I usually um, remind them just like keep track of the changes that you made because you can still use this for the portfolio because you have to revise something anyways. Um, and if they're working ahead, that's not a bad thing, right? Um, but I do the same of, you know, meets expectations, below expectations. Um, and then I do use that rubric of like, this is why it doesn't meet or this is why it does or you did this really well it's very much a conversation between uh it's very reader response heavy of like this mm -hmm. is how i experienced your paper mm -hmm. um and you know i can still say that uh even if like say for a rhetorical analysis or something like that um they used language that like non-academic language i can still say that outside of this class you're you're going to um academic genres are still going to be expected to use that academic language. Um, it's just the fact that you have to cue them in into those expectations, because if you don't, then you're doing them a disservice. You don't have to grade on those standard expectations. You just have to clue them in. Yeah, so I guess it's not, I guess, as unfortunate it is because our university still requires that end goal of yeah. a grade, we can't just say, you know, this student has, it's not a pass fail class. You can't, you didn't, you did all the work so you passed. Right. We still have to have that grade. We still have to have, um, you know, for each large assignment, it has to be complete based on certain specifications. And then we use the rubric to then look for the students. Well, at least I do personally look for mm -hmm. the students' goals within that paper, um, the risks that they took, and really looking at how they push themselves to make that paper the best that they could. Mm -hmm. um, and then not, and, I guess with something like a narrative, uh, you know, you can't really say your story about your grandpa was a C, right? right. Like that tears <laughs> students down. So it's more about saying, you know, you completed this assignment, you pushed yourself, this was awesome. It's a complete, yeah. essentially. And it's like, if you revise, you might think about this. Yeah. But they're the author, so. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for the question. That's a great question. Others. <laughs> I feel weird. I can't see anybody. <laughs> um, I have a question. I was trying to raise my hand, but I don't <laughs> see the button. Sorry. No, <laughs> This is Kirsten Eccles, um, and I'm really interested in knowing about the embodied delivery of the grading contract experience. So you all mentioned the gendered um, potentials um, through your own experience. And so I'm a black woman, and I have taught in learning communities that were centralized around race so african-american learning communities and then at the intersection of race and gender with the african-american male initiative and so for the longest i wanted to try something like grading contracts but there are so many layers to um you know the idea of trying it out one semester while trying out a themed course and all the tries um, but then also how students will respond to those things, uh, regardless of those racialized or gendered experiences. And so I'm just curious to know that when you tack it on to so many things that are already specialized, um, what advice you all may have as far as delivery is concerned. Um, like, I think it wouldn't be hard to buy into the idea for students um, to understand of this like shifting of mindset, but just how as the instructor, do you work through the actual way that you deliver it? Like, are you trying to coerce students into like 
uh, you should buy into this or are you are, are you really you know just saying like this is what it is and this is how we're doing it this semester um like just some some insight on how we might approach the delivery of the actual contract um yeah. one thing that well we both do i guess is um well i'm flat out with my students i say this is a grading contract i sent out an email earlier saying, well, one, that I was teaching a hybrid, and two, that it was a grading contract, so it, it was gonna be a different experience. Um, last semester, at the end of the semester, I have my students, my past students, essentially, they write a dear future students letter, kind of detailing the uh, benefits, the struggles, um, how to succeed in that class, and I give that out to my students that first day. Um, I explain the grading contract, I give out the letters, um, I do couch the grading contract explaining that they are likely to be uncomfortable in my class just because it's something they're not used to. They're going to uh, experience genres that they might not have experience in. Um, so I do a lot of things, but I do think it's a lot of like, this is what we're doing, but I do try to explain like, I want your feedback. I want to collaborate like let's see what's important to you and i i do push this idea that they are the authors like even when we're doing peer review i say well you have all of these um you got feedback from your from your colleagues now you have to tangle with it and make sense of what makes sense to you it is your choice um which i know is kind of a lot to throw at you but no, I, I like the way that you started that question with saying like the embodiment. I think that taking on a grading contract is something that is a full bodied experience. Mm -hmm. um, I was a completely different teacher before I took on a grading contract. Um, and I don't, I guess in my opinion, people could disagree. I don't think you can be this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, like aggressive, top of the you know you're mm -hmm. you're the top of the class type of educator um we actually just had this conversation in our yeah, class last night about um how i used to authority. be very much yeah this authoritative i used to be very much like i stood at the head of the class um i lectured mm -hmm. it wasn't like i was not going to let a student try to combat me because i was so unsure of the way that I was doing the things I was doing. And that has changed so much. I, you know, I rarely lecture unless it's something like straight up rhetoric, ethos, logos, pathos. And even then, you know, it's like 10 minutes lecture and then it's let's talk about this. Let's collaborate. Let's mm -hmm. look for real world examples and bring these things in. It's a much more collaborative, active learning community. I really like, and I, I don't know if you adapted in my preamble. To my grading contract. Mm -hmm. I've used a lot of the language that Asao uses about mm -hmm. like home studio learning. Yeah. He talks a lot about how, you know, if say that we were coming to the writing classroom here at NDSU and instead of taking this to further your education, you were taking this to learn guitar or taking this to take a cooking class. Like we would all learn and we would all learn in our own ways and it would all be great, but you would not be, you know, you would not be given that A on your knowledge of guitar at the end of that home studio type course but everybody would learn and everybody would learn at their own rate um so i really like that metaphor and i think that my students appreciate it a lot when i do talk about it in my preamble because i'll be honest i get a lot of outrage the first time they read that mm -hmm. students are uncomfortable we were on i guess i don't know about ashley yeah me and krista yeah, we were, were very uncomfortable <laughs> when we took a sow's class on and when he was you know not to call out a sow, I'm sorry, but when he straight up was like, you have to fail in order to learn. We're we were like, like no, no. <laughs> this isn't, I don't fail English courses, like we can't do this. So you, you do get a lot of pushback from students, but it's about that conversation about how, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. I'm trying to get you to learn the best way that you know how to. I'm not trying to set all of you guys on the same, you know, on the same uh, pedestal and be like, I have to grade Krista the same way that I would grade Ashley because they're both people in this classroom. I, I don't know. I feel like I'm just rambling, but I, I really, I really enjoy um, that delivery early on talking a lot about how if you were to go out and take a yoga class and learn yoga yoga through me at the end i wouldn't hand you your you know a plus in yoga or your f in yoga like the job at downward dog yeah <laughs> your a plus on your technique 
Um, so I think it's really the same thing. Like I, I've never encountered yet a student who has not been appreciative of the structure of the class after the fact. Yeah, I agree. I think they're very uncomfortable with it while they're doing it. Um, but again, that's just because they've likely never experienced something like a grading contract. Um, I say this a lot about you know my my the classes that I take. It's like I've been indoctrinated into the grading system, so like I still do want those A's, but I also acknowledge the fact that it's problematic that I want those A's because that just says something that about myself that I'm an A student, right? That's like a an identity marker, and it doesn't have to be, and I don't think it should be. Um, and so this is just I feel like a, an attempt to to break the cycle, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I mean, if you have, for, sorry, we all just kind of like stole that question and did what we wanted with it. But I think to really go back to how you approach this, I think it is about being very continuous in the things that you are doing. Like, I don't think that taking on a grading contract is something that you can feel this way at the beginning of the semester, but then at the end of the semester, you have to be that authoritative person in front of the classroom again. I think that it, it has to continuously be this collaboration between students, mm -hmm. even when all of us might be uncomfortable and we all are disagreeing with each other. We really got to have that. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've never used it, but I really appreciated like a Sal's charter for compassion, talking about how we're all in this class. We're all trying to learn. We might not, we might disagree, but that's something that we're going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. That's, that's life outside of the classroom. Yeah. I think you have, you have to trust it in your students, especially going back to group, the rubric. Oh, creation. Yeah. Question. I think we have another question. Um, I have a question, if you can, if you can hear. Um, the yeah. question is that I'm totally on board with the Charter for Compassion, and I'm totally on board with the idea that what we need to focus on is learning. And I do have my students in a scientific writing course where they do a discussion forum, just like you're talking about, where they put down what they think needs to be assessed in the rubric after dealing with some material, after a while of dealing with it and reading about it. So I compile from that. However, that rubric, unlike what you're talking about, is attached to grades that the students know about because I am, as you point out, required to assign a final grade. I'm required by the university to do that, and I cannot get around that at this point. So if you just have, and I totally get, and I certainly give them the feedback using it seeds expectations, meets, and doesn't meet, and they certainly revise until it meets, because the goal is that everybody's gonna finish, get over the finish line, right? Yep. With this particular skill, we're trying to teach a particular skill set in the case of scientific writing. Mm -hmm. um, but I am required to give that grade. So do, how do you translate from meets and exceeds to those grades? Do you pull a Noam Chomsky and basically say, what he used to say in his classes was, Everybody who just who meets expectations gets a B. Everybody who exceeds gets an A, and everybody else, you just have to drop, you know, or whatever. I mean, that's what he used to do. He only gave A's and B's as a protest against the very things you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna show the grading my grading contract. Um, if I can get out of here. Maybe. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, that might solidify some things or clarify. Oh, okay. Or, that would help. Thanks. Yeah, um, for sure. If we can. Sorry. I got <laughs> no, you're fine. I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear, the a lot of the language is um, influenced by a sow or even by Jin. Um, and this goes with my syllabus, but I don't have the syllabus here. Um, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but if you scroll all the way down to the, I have a, have like a table at the end that just explains like what you need to do um, so this um this table over here kind of has um how many days that you need to participate so that means um since my class is hybrid um i'm going by the english department absence policy so um if you if you miss more than four weeks you fail um but you know this is like missing two so two absences are essentially two weeks of being gone um late and, and ignored assignments i have um defined up above and those are some of the small things so that means that 
um, if you miss a total of four and that is late and ignored combined, then uh, you're still on track for the A. Um, for missed assignments, missed assignments are larger things. So like I have the literacy narrative, the rhetorical analysis, the proposal, and then a portfolio. And um, those things are the big things. So those are what can count as missed. And so in order to get an A or a B, um, I've got this nice table. But in conjunction, I guess, with that, there are things that you need to do if you want to go back up, actually. Um, I have a list of things that you need to do to, um, I think I have it, uh, yeah, so basically one through 10 details the expectations of the, of the course. Um, so I have the major assignments listed out right there. So there's gonna be three to four short assignments. Um, those are the response papers, and that depends on what grade you're going for. So if you're going for the A, then you're gonna do four of those. Um, you have to do the Dear Future Students letter. You have to finish um, with a check mark or a complete all four lengthy assignments. Um, and then, you know, there's the course portfolio. And then for the smaller assignments, those are discussion boards, daily writing activities, email check-ins. Um, and that is something that like they have to do, right? Uh, I've got, essentially it's just a checklist of things that they need to complete. And if they miss out on say, you know, if they're late or uh, an, if they're excessively late or if they have, um, small assignments that they don't turn in, or if they have late work that just keeps on piling up, this prevents them from reaching a B, because my contract starts at a B, but you mm -hmm. have to meet all of these expectations in order to get the B. So then if you're not meeting those expectations, then consequently you're breaking the contract, if that makes sense. And to sort of add on what Krista is saying, the way we have our contracts conceptualized here is that the grades come from from labor and effort. So that's where the completeness factor comes in. So the grade doesn't come from, you know, the meet expectations or exceeds isn't translated into a letter grade. That's just part of giving feedback. The actual grades come from this contract where there's, you know, a certain number of things you have to complete. Um, and then, you know, if you miss, we also have at our university, we have, um, uh, you know, as we mentioned, like attendance policy. So that's written in so that we're not, you know, messing up any of the university requirements. But does that help clear it up? It's not, um, it's like completeness and being, you know, turning things in on time. So it's like based on the labor and the, of the student. Mm -hmm. Did that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yes, sorry, yeah. got it. And and this is what I was kind of expecting. And like I said, um, I'm sure y'all are already familiar with this, but I brought up Noam Chomsky. And mm -hmm. this is very similar to his grading system in which he uses to fight the effects of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because he sees grades as basically a capitalist product that students turn in to, um, to succeed in the system and which causes which inherently causes failure for other students. And so he refuses to participate in it. And he has, since whenever he started teaching, well, I guess he's retired now, but whenever he started teaching there. But, um, so it's not a new sure. idea, yeah. but it's come back around. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and it, particularly in the idea of anti-racism. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly say uh, we have about one more minute left in the session and I'm happy to keep the room open if people want to keep talking, but I just wanted to, you know, if people need to leave, um, the session's almost over. So thank you so much for sharing your work with us and for everyone for participating and asking great questions. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, and we, I mean, I I'm free. can stay yeah. and if people want to answer, if want us to answer more questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't feel like an hour is adequate enough time to <laughs> talk about mm -hmm. all of the things mm -hmm. that we have no. done. And We've said it before, like we could just always talk about grading contracts yeah. and we'd be so happy. <laughs> oh, perfect. Is there anything that anybody, sorry, I don't want to like 
make people feel like they have to stay here. But if people want to see more of Krista's um, grading contract or even the preamble that we kind of mentioned too, I can always go back to that. Um, Krista's is very concise. Mine is like 12 pages. Yeah, I was just <laughs> like, I need. I was like... <laughs> Krista's is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have a question about the labor that you mentioned. Um, I know in the class that we took this summer with the anti-racist writing assessment, we talked about, uh, we tweeted, and that was like a way that a sow would measure our labor. And I'm curious if you've tried that or you subscribe to that, or if you have students do maybe write-ups after the assignment detailing their labor, or if you have them use charts. Um, so I'm just curious how you measure labor. So if you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by labor, that would be awesome. Yeah. I feel like I'm still kind of working out how exactly to measure it. I do a lot of, um, I have them reflect on um, all of the major assignments. And so I'm kind of using those to figure out what they got from it, but also the effort that they put into it or the, the time, I guess I should say, the labor that they put into it. Um, but as of right now, I feel like mine is very much just, it's labor intensive in that, um, you know, they have to do those response papers in addition to all of the major assignments. Um, and they have to complete the short assignments, the discussion boards, and they can only miss four if they want to get that A. Um, but I'm still kind of working out how do I measure this? It's, it's tricky. Um, last semester, I, I tried to use Google uh, Google Drive with my students the the way that a sow did with us and it I feel like saying that it was a disaster is probably saying it nicely like they my students struggled very much with it yeah. um, and I'm not sure if it's because they're freshmen if because they just didn't want to do it or if it's just I don't know like I don't know <laughs> what happened you know because yeah. like I'm so used to using Google Drive that I can't take that step back and say like was it was this difficult when I first started it? Um, and so, ah, I'm sorry, I like lost my train of thought and I think I'm going somewhere else with this, but <laughs> you yeah. can talk more about the Twitter though, cause you have them do it. Yep, so I have found that um, although my students haven't like got away with doing the bare minimum, um, I do have them do a lot of reflecting and Jin, um, Krista actually calls them the Dear Virginia Letters, which we came up with in that class. Um, as a group, I call them the Dear Hannah letters, but they, my students for each large assignment literally write me a letter that, and I have found that these are honestly the most enjoyable pieces of writing that they write because they're very, very honest. I have a lot of students that reflect um, on how much they enjoy an assignment, how much they push themselves, but then in the same light, I have a lot of students that reflect on how little effort they put mm -hmm. in and how badly they feel about that because it really comes back to them and they see it reflected. Um, the more that they communicate with their colleagues, the more they look at their colleagues' papers and see maybe efforts of somebody else in the course who has done a lot more, mm -hmm. um, they feel really bad about it. I have a lot of letters that people reflect and are like, I left this to the last minute and I'm not going to do that anymore because they feel bad about it and they feel bad writing me a letter confessing that mm -hmm. they didn't put in the work that they should have. Um, so that's, that's the most interesting part that I've found is how honest the students really are about their own effort. Um, and then I have incorporated, and especially in the online community, I incorporate Twitter in the same kind of way that a sow does. I do a lot of check-ins with like, show me your notes. Um, and I found that a lot of their colleagues will actually comment on like the, the same kind of way that we did, you know, commenting and saying, those are really interesting ways that you're, um, viewing this certain assignment, I saw it differently, let's communicate with that back and forth. So I think it has a lot to do, the labor, though ideally we're hoping they'll put in the most effort, I think it comes down to um, almost like peer pressure. Like they see what their colleagues are doing mm -hmm. and they see what um, other people are saying about the assignment and they want to do better based on that. Yeah. 
I would say in my course, um, well, just to back up a minute. So in a sales class, he had us uh, fill out Google Sheets mm -hmm. um, and there was a uh, formula in there. So it calculated like we would keep track of how much time we spent reading and writing and things like that. Um, and so we're measuring like by labor, we mean like just everything that students do for the class. Um, as far as like reading, taking notes, preparation, um, things like that. I decided not to use the uh, Google Sheet um, or any kind of, you know, require students to keep track of their hours, um, partly because in my class it's two sections placed into one. So like last semester I had 36 students and I just, um, to, for my own sanity, I wasn't sure about keeping track of like all 36 students' Google Sheets and like all the things that they did. Not that it couldn't be done, but um, I just, I, I felt like it was a larger commitment that I could make. Um, but what I do instead, as far as, um, since, you know, labor is what they, you know, the idea is like you complete certain things, right? Um, so I have, for checking in, one of the genres that we um, talk about in grant writing is just, you know, um, report, you know, we have them write sort of midterm memos where they talk about what the efforts, like what they've done, their, um, how much, you know, I have them sort of estimate like how much time they think they've spent on things instead of having them track it exactly. Um, and then they also have sort of a report writing they do, right? So they're reporting to their, um, you know, it could be like their project manager, right? Like this is the time that I've spent on this or this is what I've done. So um, I tell them from the beginning that they need to keep track of what they do, but, um, but I don't uh, require, you know, require them to do it. But it's something we talk about as far as just in, in the theme of the class, just sort of project management and stuff like that. So um, I know what they do because they turn it in. Like I know at least their final products, right? So I don't, I don't know exactly how much time they spend outside, um, but I, I'm kind of interested, you know, maybe one day I'll try the, the Google Sheets, um, <laughs> tracking all the hours and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I also struggle with the Google Sheets because like it worked for me because like I'm very honest, but like I think of how very easy it would be to just be like, mm -hmm. I did this thing for four hours. But I think that comes back too. like, yeah. I think if you're willing the to myth, like, fabricate the <laughs> Well, yeah, the myth is that the grading contract does allow that. Mm -hmm. I really... I guess I have not encountered a student no. that would do that because they are very honest and mm -hmm. you know, true. I'll have students that have come up to me and been like, yeah, I didn't spend very much time on this. Like, yeah. I, I promise I'll do better. You know, like they're, mm -hmm. it's placed back on them and what they want out of the class. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions out there? All right, great. Well, thank you again so much for giving your time and making this presentation. This was really, really helpful. Um, if you guys want to send me any uh, contracts or anything else that you want me to send out to the rest of the participants, um, if you could just like forward those on to me now, yeah, that would yeah. be great. Um, and I'll just, I'll make sure to include those in the wrap up email that I send out. Awesome. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank yeah, you guys so much thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah. yeah. You too. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.